You don't need to understand the structure and dynamics of the psyche to begin healing your negative father complex, and you also don't need to change your literal relationship with your flesh and blood father to start healing your daddy issues. I want you to have safe, secure, and a collaborative connection with men, masculinity, and manhood, but it's not going to be an easy task because you need to heal your father wounds. I can't stand here and lie to you and tell you that this will be anything short of a monumental effort. We've got 120 years of psychotherapy stretching all the way behind us to prove that this is one of the major issues for humans, and you're going to need courage and commitment to assess yourself internally at a very deep level and restructure yourself at a deep psychological level to actually get the benefit of healthy relationships with men and masculinity. And that's what I'm going to try and give you in this video. I've read the literature, not just this book, but dozens of books on this topic so that you don't have to. And what I'm going to try and provide you is very practical, but also invitational video towards both the application and the theory of the father complex on how to form just healthy relationships with men and masculinity. So let's frame the conversation initially with the deep end and then we will make it shallower and shallower and then deeper and deeper and wed the two together. But fundamentally, let's frame a really important point before we go into Carl Jung and another book which I'm about to hold up. Every single father wound, every relationship to our father can be broken down into three qualities. The proximity, the emotional texture, and the intensity. Proximity, how close. Emotional texture, what kind of feelings. And intensity, how much of those feelings. Some fathers are too far away, too cold, and way too little. Other fathers are way too close, way too hot, and way too much. And sometimes we've got these confusing mixtures in between where someone can be too far away and too hot or too close and too cold. Of course, I'm oversimplifying, but if you reflect in this moment, what was your father like? Was he too far? Was he too close? Was he too hot? Was he too cold? What was the intensity like? More or less, we can define every single adult to father and child to father relationship based on these three qualities and it's going to be unique for you as the individual that you are. That's a crucial framing that we're going to return back to in about five minutes time after going into the theory of the complex because some people will really appreciate that full deep dive before we stretch it back to applicability which of course is the aim of this channel. I want you to actually heal things not just think about healing things. But let's dive into Carl Jung so he can give us a bit of a fearful fright into the complexes and the issue of psychological complexity and wounding. Quote from the book. Complexes are something so unpleasant that nobody in his right senses can be persuaded that the motive force which maintained them could betoken anything good. It gets even more theatrical. Only when you have seen whole families destroyed by them, morally and physically, and the unexampled tragedy and hopeless misery that follow in their train, do you feel the full impact of the reality of complexes? It is not a wonderful picture at all, but we need to step into it. Final quote from Carl Jung, back to the other page. You can actually see that I've, I'm going backwards and forwards because Jung is known for sometimes being a bit circular, which is fine, he's also linear, but circularity is important. Despite overwhelming evidence of all kinds that complexes have always existed and are ubiquitous, people cannot bring themselves to regard them as normal phenomena of life. The fear of complexes is a rooted prejudice. For the superstitious fear of anything unfavorable has remained untouched by our vaunted enlightenment. Oh, Carl, you have a way with words. This fear provokes violent resistance whenever complexes are examined and considerable determination is needed 
to overcome it. And I wrote here, just in the margin, okay, let's overcome it. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But Carl Jung, although he is very good at stirring up the emotions in this particular quote, is not necessarily very useful or very comforting. So let's turn towards someone who's a little bit more accessible and a little bit more practically minded. We're going to look at Murray Stein, or Murray Stein, I don't know if he's actually German, but Murray Stein, and Jung's Map of the Soul. He's continuing here with a wonderful section titled The Structure of the Complexes. I'm going to read one more extended quote, and then we're going to pack these two quotes together to create the theoretical foundation to then go back to the application of how to heal your flesh and blood relationship and also the psychological relationship, because... We're going to do a full spectrum. Let's go into the information, shall we? Again, recommend you get these books for yourself. This is one of the best books on Jungian theory that covers the whole range of Jung's ideas in arguably the best single packet application I've found so far. So definitely get this book and maybe the structure and dynamics of the psyche if you really want to nerd out on psychological theory. Let's get practical. What does Murray Stein have to say about the complexes and healing them? Let's go into it. Jung describes it as being made up of associated images and frozen memories of traumatic moments are buried in the unconscious and not readily available for retrieval by the ego. We know this, that's what Carl Jung just said, a complex is buried in the unconscious. Okay, where do we go from this? These are repressed memories. What knits the various associated elements of the complex together and holds them in place is emotion. Emotion being the core thread. This is the glue. Furthermore, quote, the feeling-toned content, the complex consists of nuclear element and a large number of secondarily constellated associations. And he's quoting Young there, and you see how it just got more complex. Um, pun intended. Continues a little bit further on. He's talking about the two elements of the complex, and this is why I'm trying to really frame this first, because you can see how muddy and sticky it is to stay close to the literature when it comes to something which can actually be quite simple and yet it is important to go into. So bear with me for just one more minute. But this core turns out to be made up of two parts, an image or psychic trace of the originating trauma and an innate, brackets, archetypal piece closely associated to it. The dual core of the complex grows by gathering associations around itself, and this can go on over the course of an entire lifetime. If, for example, a man reminds a woman of her harsh, abusive father by his tone of voice, by his way of reacting to life, and by his intensity of emotional response, and so on, he will understandably constellate her father complex, this is a situation where the woman has a complex and the man constellates that same historically rooted traumatic and archetypal psychological image around who he is because the match is a resonance. If she interacts with him over a period of time, material will be added to that complex. If he abuses her, the negative father complex will be further enriched and energized and she will become all the more reactive in situations where the father complex is constellated. Final sentence, very heavy on the quotes. I'm not normally this heavy on the books, but most people actually still somehow don't read the books that I hold up, so sometimes it's worth bringing out the quote. And of course, I know many wonderful people do read the books, but I want a book in every single hand, so I will keep making the same point. Increasingly, she may avoid such men entirely, or on the other hand, she may find herself irrationally drawn to them, in either case, her life becomes more and more restricted by the complex. The stronger the complex, the more they restrict the range of the ego's freedom of choice. That's enough of the books. I hope it's clear from going through that long, drawn-out process of reading at length, even just two paragraphs from these books, that it can get very sticky. You can get quagmired in the theory in a way which actually takes away the energy of the conversation. I notice myself losing the train of the actual change when I'm going too deep into the theory, which is why I don't recommend that you actually 
go too far into the theory itself if you want to heal your father wound. All of this information wrapped up together in regards to the trauma and the archetypal image coming together, the actual lived experience of your relationship with your father and the archetypal image of the father as a symbolic force will have a unique makeup inside of you as an individual. Your particular relationship to your father again has three qualities, proximity, intensity, and emotional texture. I summarized those two books for you right there in regards to the father complex, proximity, intensity, and emotional texture, and you will go significantly towards the healed end of the healing spectrum if you can properly identify exactly what that was for you and then specifically reparent yourself and calibrate towards healthier opposites of that version of masculinity. Let's break it down into an example. Let's say again that a certain girl grows up with a certain father who is emotionally abusive and way too much. This is the devouring father. And it's just horrific. Unfortunately, this is a common situation for many girls. How does she heal this particular father wound? It's not that he's absent, it's that he's way too much. Or maybe it's dating a man who has the ability to give her alone time without being consuming. Maybe it's having male friends who also have the same quality. Or maybe, in terms of the full autonomous self-healing cycle, she can develop a relationship with herself and her own emotionality, which isn't all-consuming. Some of her inner masculine, her internal masculine self-restructuring work can be around re-navigating her own image of the father as not being this force which is completely tyrannically, linearly penetrating into her world. You can be a much softer, laid back, go if you want, come if you want, you can stay, you can leave, I'm here no matter what, safe, dependable, reliable, and the right level of intensity in the right appropriate context. That's one example. Let's flip it around. Let's say a boy grows up with a father who is literally absent, not in the life at all. What's the healing path? It's the opposite. It's developing a relationship with men and with masculinity where you have brotherhood, you have mentorship, you have feelings of internal connection to the archetypes, the king, warrior, magician, lover, but also the, uh, the trickster or the poet or the particular version of the mixtures all coming together, maybe the samurai archetype, maybe the young prince archetype, maybe the scholar archetype. The young man can develop a conscious relationship with healthier images of masculinity to heal piece by piece that very negative impression that was received through the psychic absence of a healthy father figure. The absent father is a difficult one because not only did the child suffer from a lack of masculine guidance, the child who hasn't got a healthy father image will naturally lean towards fear and hesitancy and speculation and paranoia if the father's not around. It's not just dad who becomes the absent, mysterious, kind of threatening stranger. It's all men. The boy who grows up with an absent father typically will be very afraid of men at a deeper psychological level. He'll struggle to make male friendships and he'll struggle to work with male colleagues because he's going to feel like they're hiding something or something's not being seen. It doesn't even take a fully absent father for that to be an experience in either a little boy or a little girl. The very common experience of the negative father, father complex is the dad who goes to work and isn't around too much. You see him in the evenings or maybe you see him on the weekend but he's out in the shed or down at the sports place or wherever it may be. He's kind of in the world but not in the world. He's a bit away from the home and you don't really spend quality time with him. He's absent. He's emotionally absent. And this is where we get back to proximity, intensity, and the emotional texture. He's far away, and when you see him, it might be a mixture of warm and a mixture of cold, but the intensity itself is kind of low. He's just not around, and the speculative child or teenager is going to naturally lean towards paranoia and a 
suspect that he's doing shady or morally malevolent things unless it is abundantly clear that he is a great man. And this unfortunately is not the dynamic in most households because in most households where the father is this way emotionally, there won't necessarily be, ne necessarily be the most emotionally stable mother and there might often be these dynamics of the mother then bad-mouthing the father to the child and the child becomes a confidant or it might be the case that the community just doesn't speak about the father. He doesn't have status. He doesn't have respect. He's not a great man. He's not even a good man. He's just kind of out there doing things which the child doesn't understand. Again, as adults, you and I can have this conversation on a much higher level, but from a six-year-old's perception, if dad isn't being spoken about and celebrated in a way where it's repeatedly encouraged, i.e. even if he's working out there, and he's not around too much, having the mom say, I don't know, let's go with a traditional example. This is something that we could really see a lot more of. Let's imagine the man's out there working and he's doing a manual labor job and he's gone for 60 hours a week. If the mother can healthily psychologically imprint the child with a feeling of gratitude towards the father, i.e. dad's not around today, but he paid for all this wonderful food before we eat, let's say, thank you, dad. And everyone goes, thank you, dad that creates a good father image. He might still be absent and there might be issues there, but that feeling of love and admiration and respect and union within the family is a necessary component that many of us tragically missed out on. What we often get is the mother who complains because dad's at the office again or I is doing overtime down at the garage. There's not a loving, understanding feeling of union and collaborative partnership, so the boy or the girl who grows up in that environment doesn't expect loving, collaborative partnership with the men in their life. They're to be mistrusted and not to be counted upon. So and so and so on. There are many things that we could have done, but we can't go back and change the past. I hope this general psychoeducation is bringing up ideas inside of you. It's going to depend upon your individual circumstance in regards to how to heal the wounded father experience. The fundamental thing that I invite your attention towards is how to properly define and assess the particular qualities that you spun in, the particular stories that your mother told about your father, or the way that your siblings related to your father, how you took on caretaking roles or rebellious roles in relation to the man who should be the most important man in your life when you're a child. And if they weren't there at all, what were the images that you were seeing of other men in the culture? And knowing that those stories can be shifted in the same way that I stand before you as a man who hopefully is more or less healthy and you wouldn't label me with such a superficial shallow image as like the best man ever or the worst man ever because I'm clearly a human who's got great qualities and arguably quite questionable and unpalatable qualities. That's easy because you don't have such an emotional relationship with me. Your father can become the same from a level of detachment. You can separate your particular relationship with him as an individual, um, as a father, as you as a child, and see him just as a man. And you can see the struggle. You can see the hardship. And if he was a particularly shitty character, a point in the healing journey is when you can choose to forgive or not forgive. You can choose to see the situation as it is, you can choose, if it's an abusive situation, to understand and not forgive. You can understand and forgive, but whatever you do, don't go down to don't understand and do forgive because that's likely to come up as a repressive shadow attack in the future. You need to properly understand why he was the way he was before you can properly forgive and you can't jump towards that point in time. And for some people that I've worked with, they don't need to forgive their absent or abusive father to heal the father wound. They can accept it and they can more or less be at peace with it while also condemning the action and refusing to accept more of that into their life. The young man who grew up in a family where the parents were together, let's say, and there was an abusive dynamic where he saw his dad hitting his mom, can understand and accept that that was what was happening as a 30 or 40 year old man and still not forgive that. You get to choose. You get to choose the moral qualities of manhood that you do accept and don't accept, and that's what creates a new story of masculinity. 
one of the core ideas of what it means for men to be men is that you decide ethics and values that you want to live by and try and stay close to. It's that feeling of walking on a path of your own integrity. And if you saw examples of men not living like that, you don't have to repeat them. And often this means a feeling of pushing away and condemning, which initially will be quite charged. Someone at the very first stages of healing their father wounds will feel a lot of rage, usually a lot of sorrow, but a lot of rage is often these clammy hands and quite aggressive movements, the bioenergetic wanting to punch or wanting to kick or wanting to scream. You see this in cathartic group workspaces where people will be screaming into pillows and beating them with tennis rackets. The reason is normally the negative father or negative mother complex as a physical violent reaction as you're healing through that wound at the very beginning in a safe, controlled environment. The next stage, you get to choose what version of masculinity or femininity, if we're talking about the mother wound, that you actually want to orient yourself around, cultivate inside of yourself, and the standard that you accept from the men and also, I guess, the women in your life who bring forwards an energetic signature that you can relate to and grow inside of. How do we wrap this all together? When it comes to the father wound, you need to psychoeducate. And from that place of psychoeducating, you can gain simultaneously the distance and the overview perspective to not be so wrapped up in the old story and not have that situation where the archetypal image is completely overlaid on the physical man or the physical man completely covers up the archetypal image. I don't want your experience of having a less than perfect or arguably maybe not so good father to get in the way of the beautiful life nourishing qualities of the father. I'm not talking about God our father in a Christian context. I'm talking about the generative possibilities of a really healthy dad. Like the really wonderful man that you sometimes see in stories, not too often tragically, I think there's a sad situation going on in the media right now where we don't see enough examples of really healthy, strong dads. We see the bumbling idiot like the Homer Simpson character or the Peter Griffin character who you know, really don't add much to their family apart from the goofy lovability of always making mistakes. That's an old story which we need to drop and rapidly bury because the truly healthy father is a life-nourishing, essential element to human society in the same way that the truly healthy mother is also the natural complement. Both of those archetypal images being elevated and praised in their health and their radiance and not confusing, again, the actual mothers or the actual fathers that we had for collapsing the entire breadth and depth of the possibilities of masculinity or femininity. I feel like we're getting into another topic just there, in which case I'm going to end the video and we will go right into the next topic. Show me over there.